Hello. On behalf of the Historical Society of Harford County, welcome to this afternoon's presentation, The North Atlantic Cities. Before we begin, please be aware that this event is being recorded and will be made available publicly through the Historical Society webpage and on the Society's YouTube channel. The Historical Society of Harford County collects, preserves, promotes, and interprets the rich and diverse history of the Harford County area in its regional context from prehistoric origins to the present for the education and enjoyment of current and future generations. The Society operates its headquarters at 143 North Main Street and the Hayes House Museum, both located in Bel Air. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Society buildings are closed to the public and we are holding all our events virtually. I'm Jackie Seneshaw, your host for this virtual brown bag lunch. Our presentation today focuses on the regional context of Harford County and our great nearby metropolitan cities, Baltimore and Philadelphia. The speaker today, Charles Duff, is president of Jubilee Baltimore and a lover of all things historical, architectural, urban design, and Baltimore. He has written a beautiful book, The North Atlantic Cities, in which he argues that the row house, or the terrace house as it's known to Europeans, is one key to the architecture, culture, and economics of a ring of cities stretching from Amsterdam through London and Boston to Baltimore and Richmond. Charlie holds a master's degree in urban planning from the Harvard School of Design. And his first job out of graduate school was in the Harford County Department of Planning and Zoning, where he served as area planner for the Joppa Town, Edgewood, and Abingdon areas. Charlie, the microphone is yours. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Jackie was too modest. Jackie and I were at Planning and Zoning together, uh, 1981 to, I left in 1985. Uh, Carol Dybel was far too modest. She hasn't said anything at all. Carol and I shared an office. I'm still amazed that Carol's on speaking terms with me. I have a very loud voice. I talk on the phone all the time. God bless you, Carol, for being so kind to me. At any rate, Harford County is, is very dear to me. For one thing, it gave me a job when I desperately needed one. But for another thing, it got me into the society of people like Jackie and Carol. And what an amazing, what an amazing, place to work planning and zoning was. Um, I loved it. I have the happiest memories of it. Um, and it's good to be back. Uh, I come to Harford County fairly often because my best friend from nursery school on married a Bel Air girl, Annette Cameron, and lives out there now. And Annette, I think, maybe in the audience, but I don't know. And if you are Annette, it's being recorded, so don't say anything rude. Uh, at any rate, as Jackie points out, I've written a book and I'd like to show you some pictures that relate to it. And for that, I think I get to share the screen. Look at this PowerPoint. Whoops, go up to the top, turn it into a slideshow, do it from the start. And there's the cover of the book. Uh, the book is called The North Atlantic Cities. I'm called Charles Duff. Uh, and the cover tells you both of those things. And then it shows you something. It shows you one of my favorite pictures ever made, a picture painted in a little town in Holland called Delft in about 1670 by a guy named Johannes Vermeer. And why does a book about, you know, written by a guy from Baltimore start with a picture of a house from 1670 in Holland? Well, let's go see. If you look at the two coasts of the North Atlantic Ocean, you will find people building cities and buildings in a similar way, and nobody else builds cities and buildings in those ways. Think about our side of the ocean, the middle Atlantic states. Um, there are a whole bunch of cities there that we take for granted. You can get to them on Amtrak, and they are all built in the same way. Similarly, on the other side of the ocean, cities in Holland, Belgium, the U United Kingdom, and the Republic of Ireland are built in the same way. These are the North Atlantic cities. 
the ocean that appears to divide them, and it is actually 3,000 miles wide and it gets pretty stormy, the ocean that appears to divide them has in fact united them in the biggest trade routes and the biggest routes of migration, voluntary and involuntary, in modern history. And that's been going on for 400 years. So it's not really any accident that the two cities, on, that the cities on the two coasts of the North Atlantic, which have so much in common in so many ways, actually build in the same ways. And the way they build influences greatly the kind of lives that people live in them. What on earth am I talking about? First of all, how do you know if your city is North Atlantic? You can look at this list. Here's a list from the back cover of my book. These are the big North Atlantic cities, according to me. And by the way, if you've never heard the phrase North Atlantic cities, don't feel guilty. It's a phrase that I have invented. I didn't invent the North Atlantic cities. They'd been there for a long time, but I did discover them. And I claim the glory of discovering that this is a family of cities, that they have more in common with each other, often across the ocean, than they do with cities in their own continents. Uh, these are the North Atlantic cities from Amsterdam to Washington with a whole bunch piled in the middle like London and Philadelphia, Birmingham, Boston, New York. These are the North Atlantic cities. How can you tell if your city is North Atlantic? Look at the old neighborhoods of your city and if the old neighborhoods of your city have row houses, your city is most likely a North Atlantic city. Um, I'm from Baltimore. I live in Baltimore now. Baltimore is a city that has row houses. And in fact, the row houses that you're looking at are the row houses that I see when I walk out of the front door of my house in Landvale Street in Bolton Hill. And I walk out fairly often, if only because I have a dog. So Baltimore qualifies as a North Atlantic city in that it is a city whose old neighborhoods have row houses. All right, you might be saying, thank you, Mr. Duff, that's very interesting. But we're Harford County, why should we care about this? We're not a city at all. We don't have old city neighborhoods. Why should we care about London and Amsterdam and Baltimore and all those dense places? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, well, wait, first of all, you have to understand why I care. I don't just care because I like to write books and look at old pictures. Ever since I left Harford County in 1985, I've been working in Baltimore as a developer on a nonprofit basis. Seems pretty weird to have a nonprofit real estate developer. It's like having you know, a nonprofit casino or something. But uh, Baltimore needs a lot of rebuilding and my colleagues and I have done a lot of it. We have restored about 300 historic buildings in Baltimore. We've built housing for about 800 Baltimore families. We've led the revival of a bunch of Baltimore City's old neighborhoods, like the neighborhoods around Mount Vernon Place and Patterson Park. So that's why I care about this, but why should you care about it? Well, here's some reasons. The first reason, whoops, gotta get my slide back, is this man whom I hope you know. This is Jim Wallen. Jim Wallen of Craig's Corner Road in Churchville, Maryland is the master of all of us who care about the architectural history of Baltimore. And the Harford County Historical Society was certainly dear to, uh, to Jim's heart. Uh, Jim taught me much more than I know and is one of the most wonderful people I've ever known. And as a seventh generation Harford County and living on the same land, he cared more deeply about the architecture of Baltimore than any Baltimorean I've ever met. So there's one reason. Here's another. What's more Baltimore than Mount Vernon Place? Here you have the Washington Monument surrounded by his great historic buildings of the 19th century. I would ask you to look over on the left of this picture behind the tree. You'll see a white house with a little bit of a curve to the front. See that? But in case you can't see it, here is a blow up of it. This house is unbelievably elaborate and Victorian. It's made entirely out of marble. It was built in 1889. There are 11 different ways of cutting marble on the front of this house. And there is amazing delicate sculpture in marble around the door and in other places. 
This is high Victorian architecture in Mount Vernon Place in Baltimore. Why should you care about it? Because it was designed by a fellow named George Archer, a Baltimore architect from Bel Air, Maryland. Uh, that Harford County and Baltimore have been part of the same labor market for hundreds of years. And people who have designed in one have often lived in the other or come from the other or moved to the other. People who have lived in one have often built in the other. And many of the best construction people I work with nowadays are proud to go home every night to Harford County. We are one labor market, we're one bunch of people, we're one community. And that's been going on for a long time. You can see that in some of the historic architecture of your county. I wanted to get a good picture of Mary Risto's house. Um, and one of you was kind enough to send me one, but it didn't really show it. This is not Mary Risto's house, but it may as well be Mary Risto's house. And up in the northern part of Harford County, you'll find houses that look like this. There are four windows across, they have pitched roofs, and they have two front doors. Someday I want to find out why they do, and I hope one of you knows that. But all I want to point out is that this house may as well be any two of these houses. That this very typical Harford County, Southern Pennsylvania farmhouse is in fact, as a building, identical to two row houses. Uh, and since row houses were often built in pairs and stitched together gradually, there was conceivably a time when houses in this picture looked like this, except they didn't have porches. So from Northern Harford County to Fells Point, historically, a lot in common in the design and the construction of houses, an architectural region. And then there's a corker. If you go to Riverside in Bell Camp today, you can buy this house. It's for sale. And so are lots of, well, we would call them townhouses today, but if we didn't call them townhouses, we might well call them row houses here in Riverside in Bell Camp. Or coming upland a bit, here's one that's for sale right now, today. You can buy it today in Abingdon, a row house in a row of houses. Or if you're upcountry in Bel Air, the row house is there for you too. You don't have to desert it and leave it down in the lowlands. The row houses come up into the Piedmont in Harford County. You don't find houses like this in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona. You don't find houses like this in the suburbs of Minneapolis, Minnesota, or New Orleans, Louisiana, or Miami, Florida. You do find houses like this in Harford County, Maryland. You find thousands of them and people are still building them today. Why? Because Harford County, although it's not a city, is a part of the region from which the row house cities, the North Atlantic cities emerged and to which the North Atlantic cities have given architectural guidance. And then I guess if you want, you can think about how many of you and how many of your neighbors in Harford County either grew up in Baltimore City or had grandparents or great grandparents who grew up in Baltimore City. Um, I have worked in Baltimore City for people who lived in Harford County and I have commuted from Baltimore City to Harford County to work along with some of my colleagues. So Harford County is more a part of the world of row house cities than you might think. There is in fact a great deal of row house suburbia in Harford County. And you don't find that anywhere except in the region around the North Atlantic cities. Don't all cities have row houses in the middle? If you're from like, if you're from Baltimore as I am, and you grow up in Baltimore, you would say, well, sure, that's what a city is. Every city has row houses in its old neighborhoods. And when I was growing up, this was what Baltimore looked like. But when we would go to Washington to visit, Washington was in many ways different from Baltimore. It had the Washington Monument and the Capitol. 
that when we would go and visit my Uncle Donnie and my Aunt Catherine, they lived in this street and it looked like Baltimore. It was a street of row houses and Washington, although it has the Smithsonian Institution and all kinds of things like that, is a city of row houses, just like Baltimore. Every now and then when I was growing up, mainly with my scout troop, I would go to Philadelphia, usually to look at the Liberty Bell or the Franklin Institute. Philadelphia in some respects was different from Washington and Baltimore, but not in one respect. Philadelphia had row houses, just like Washington and Baltimore. And in fact, Philadelphia has more row houses than any city in the United States, and right nice ones too, many of them. When I was 20, I had a junior year abroad, and I got off an airplane in London, took a bus into town, and found this. London is in many respects different from Washington, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. It's got a queen, for one thing. People drive on the wrong side of the road. But in one respect, London felt like home. Um, well, two, it had bad food, which I was used to, but also it had row houses. And London, in fact, has more row houses than any city in the world. And if you are used to Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, London will feel like home to you. About a year later, two of my high school friends came over to England. We got on a ferry and five hours later, we were in Paris. Uh, it's hard to say anything original about Paris. People have been talking about Paris for a thousand years and they've said pretty much everything that you need to say about a city. Paris is a pretty nice place. I think I'm about to tell you something that you may never have heard anybody say about Paris. You ready? Paris does not have row houses. This is a typical old neighborhood in Paris. Uh, if you can find a more beautiful city, let's go. I think Paris is probably the most beautiful city I've ever been in. That's not very original. But the beautiful old buildings of Paris are not row houses like the beautiful old buildings of Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and London. The big, beautiful old buildings of Paris are big and they are apartment houses. Parisians have been living in apartment houses for hundreds of years. They never had row houses. They don't have them now. Paris, and what kind of life do you lead if you live in Paris? Well, an enviable life, many people would say, but let's think about it in day-to-day in -day terms. Paris is dense, it's crowded. Paris has almost as many people per square mile as Manhattan Island. I hope you've all been to Manhattan Island and Manhattan Island is pretty crowded. People who live in Manhattan Island tend to live in small apartments. They have trouble entertaining at home. In Paris, the average apartment is only about half as big as the average apartment on Manhattan Island. Parisians live in small, cramped, dark apartments and they have the most beautiful buildings and the most beautiful streets in the world. So you wonder, okay, if people live in these small apartments, they probably don't want to stay there all the time. And if the apartments are that small, it's hard to have friends over and entertain at home. They must do something else. But I thought, gee, what, what do they do? So I did what everybody does. I asked Mr. Google. I typed in the words, Paris street life. And here's the first picture that came up. And this looks like Paris to me. I haven't spent enough time in Paris to satisfy myself. I don't think I ever could, but I have spent enough to know what it looks like out on the street. And it looks like this. The Parisians invented the restaurant. It's a French word after all. They perfected the cafe. And with so many people per acre, so many people per square mile, you can have restaurants and shops on virtually every block of virtually every street. If you can't entertain at home, if you want to get out of your cramped little apartment, go sit on a sidewalk in the most beautiful streets in the world. And this is a way of living that turned out to be pretty common in continental Europe. Paris was the first city I ever went to that did not have row houses. And its way of living is the same way that people live in Berlin, in Rome, in Vienna, in the great cities of inland Europe, the great cities of continental Europe. The cities of continental Europe, if you want to think about them in a sound bite, have high densities and brilliant street life. 
on almost every street. Paris is the best of them, but they're all like that. And very different from Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and London. Well, that was when I was 21. That was quite a discovery. When I was 23, I got on an airplane and went west of the Appalachian Mountains for the first time, and I made another discovery. I discovered the cities of continental North America, and they were really different too. This is an aerial picture of Houston, Texas, which is a pretty typical city of continental North America. In the center is a very dense, very crowded downtown. The tallest buildings in this picture are 80 stories tall, twice as tall as the tallest buildings in downtown Baltimore. And when you're standing on a street in the center of Houston, you might think you're in New York. But look what happens as soon as you get away from the skyscrapers. All the density goes away. You've got more open land than you have buildings. One friend of mine looked at this picture and said, it looks like Arlington National Cemetery. And when you poke into the neighborhoods of Houston, well, here's the great historic district of Houston. Looks like home to me. Uh, in the suburbs or in parts of Harford County. Uh, doesn't look much like a row house city and it certainly doesn't look much like Paris. Paris is much more crowded than we are. Houston is much less crowded. Paris has 200 families to an acre. Baltimore has about 40 families to an acre. Houston has about five families to an acre. And if you live in a Houston house like this, you can mow lawn, you can barbecue in the backyard, you've got a living room, your house is nice to sit around in, you can entertain at home. But with so few people to an acre, can you have any kind of street life at all? Can you have any kind of a public life? Well, you know, Mr. Google told me what street life was like in Paris, so I tried it for Houston. I said, Mr. Google, I'm typing in Houston street life and here's the first picture that came up. If you live in Houston at five families to the acre, you have to get in a car or better yet a pickup and drive a couple of miles just to buy a tube of toothpaste. Uh, there's no pedestrian life at all, except poor Nero here fiddling while hydrocarbons burn. Uh, so, I grew up thinking there was only one way to build a city, which was it had old row houses in the middle and then it had Harford County on the outside. Turns out people in continental Europe have a different way where cities are very dense and they have brilliant street life. And people in continental North America have different, a very different way, which is sprawling suburbs around skyscrapers. Two really, really different ways of building cities in the interior of Europe and the interior of North America, and in between on the coasts of both North America and Europe, you get our cities, the cities of row houses. Here is Washington, here's Georgetown, where my uncle Donnie and Aunt Catherine live. Georgetown is not as dense as Paris. It's maybe 30 families to the acre, it's not 200, but it's denser than Houston. It's maybe 30 families to the acre, it's not five. If you live in a Georgetown house, you get plenty of light, you have multiple rooms, it's nice to be at home, you can entertain at home, you can have people over. Uh, it's just like Houston. Uh, you don't have to mow lawn, it's even better than Houston. But suppose you want public life, street life, like Paris, you have as life as Paris, you just can't. But I asked Mr. Google, what's Georgetown street life like? And here's the first picture that came up. And this picture is four blocks away from the picture that you looked at. When a row house neighborhood is working well, when a row house city is working well, you can have the best of both worlds. You can have a house that's fit to live in, a house that's pleasant to be in. And you can be four minutes walk from a good commercial street, from seeing people, from not being alone, from catching up, from buying a tube tooth, of toothpaste. So there are three ways of building a city in what we call the Western world. The apartment house cities of Europe, the suburban cities of continental North America, and in between the row house cities, the North Atlantic cities, uh, which are actually the subject of my book. So 
Were there always row houses? Here's a quick historical sketch. You ready? Hang on to your hats. We're going through 400 years in about 10 minutes. Uh, back before there were row houses, there were kind of primitive proto row houses. Here's a picture that was drawn in London in about 1600. This is Shakespeare's London. In some ways, these are the ancestors of row houses. They're tall and they're narrow. They're very tall, they're five stories tall. These were the houses of rich people, but they're built like shacks. They're made out of wood, they have exterior plaster, and the climate of London is cold and wet, which is hard on wood and plaster. If you look at the little alley between these two houses, look up at the third floor level, and you'll see what looks like a log running across the alley. Can you see that? You know what that is? That is, in fact, a log. And if you're wondering, why would somebody go to all the trouble of hauling a log up to the third floor of his house and slinging it across an alley? The answer is to keep their houses from falling down. As late as 1600, the common people of cities in Northern Europe, that is France and England, were living in shacks. They were living in the, the, the butt end of the medieval tradition. And they didn't get any fancy architecture. Architecture was just for kings and noblemen. Common people didn't get architecture in places like Paris and London as late as the year 1600. Um, and you had, you know, London had 200,000 people and they all lived like this and it must have been disgusting. They say that you could smell Shakespeare's London from 25 miles away. So people wanted to do something better than this. And who were the first people to do it? The first people to do it were the Dutch. And they made a revolution in house building in the first half of the 1600s. The Dutch in the first half of the 1600s were the first people to build middle-class houses out of durable materials, brick usually, uh, that don't fall down like the wooden shacks of London. How do you know they don't fall down? Because they're still there. Here's a picture of them. 400 years later. And look at the tops of these houses. What you are looking at is the fancy architecture of the 1600s. The Dutch were the first big country that was run by middle-class people, wasn't run by kings or noblemen. And so the Dutch were the first people who gave middle-class houses real stylish architecture. And they did it in exactly the generation when you would hope that the Dutch would do something. The Dutch have a golden age of painting. The great painters were Rembrandt and Vermeer and Hals. And all these guys lived in one generation. Here is Vermeer's painting of the girl in a pearl earring. The generation of Rembrandt and Vermeer was the generation of Dutchmen who invented the row house. And the row house, what we think of as the row house, is as much an artistic product of the Dutch golden age as the paintings of Rembrandt or Vermeer, and it does what Rembrandt and Vermeer were doing in paint. Look at this picture. Who is she? Nobody knows. Somebody fancy? Somebody important? Probably not. Some girl, Vermeer, put a scarf on her head and painted her. What the great painters of the Dutch Golden Age did was to discover that ordinary people could be fashionable, could be fascinating and beautiful, and that's what they did in buildings. They discovered that the lives and the buildings of ordinary people could make beautiful cities. This, I believe, is the city of Utrecht. It might actually be Leiden. It doesn't matter very much. They're both beautiful. Dutch cities are, I think, the pleasantest in the world. I've walked hundreds of miles in Dutch cities, and I'm up for hundreds more. Um, the Dutch invented our way of building, and they built beautiful cities. If I showed you this picture and told you that it was 18th century London or 18th century Philadelphia, you might believe me, because you can't quite see that the street at the bottom is a canal, but the street at the bottom is a canal. This picture was painted in Amsterdam in 1672. And by 1672, the Dutch were building buildings that would look just fine if they were on my street in Bolton Hill. And and they built, they invented our way of building urban buildings. They invented the row house. It didn't take long for the English to figure this out. London burnt down in 1666. 
Parliament instantly passed a rebuilding act with a building code, and the building code required that every new building in London be rebuilt in the Dutch style. It had to be brick, it had to have organized windows, um, and this is what London looked like as it was rebuilt between 1666 and 1674. If this looks like the old parts of Baltimore or Philadelphia, that's no accident. This is the North Atlantic world coming together. Um, as the 18th century went on, the Dutch and London way of building spread throughout the British Isles. My favorite British city is the city of Bath. This is what Bath looks like if you happen to be a bird with marvelous circles and crescents and a very interesting street pattern. If you don't happen to be a bird, Bath is plenty pleasant, just walking around. You might look at this building and think that it's the palace of a king or a prince or a cardinal. It's not, it's a row of houses. And you can figure out which house is which by looking at the curtains or the shutters. These houses are about as big as my house in Baltimore, but they are treated with architectural seriousness and great beauty. The Scots copied the architecture and planning of Bath to build the new town of Edinburgh beginning in 1770. And the new town of Edinburgh is alive and well today and is, you know, again, one of the, one of the great places. And if you've ever been to Dublin in Harford County and you wonder what it's named after, Dublin in Harford County is named after one of my favorite row house cities in the world. You can walk four miles in Dublin, Ireland, and this is what you see. Streets that are beautifully framed by houses that are fit to live in with churches and public monuments lining things up. Um, much of my ancestry is Ireland, Irish, and so I didn't expect much in Ireland. I figured if Ireland had been nice, we probably would have stayed there. Well, all I can say is we must have been fools, either that or we were Catholics and poor, and at any rate, we left. But the people who stayed behind built Dublin, and boy, is it ever a wonderful, wonderful city. The row house turned out to fit pretty gracefully onto ships. By 1682, William Penn has started Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is the first city that really gets the London way of building, the Dutch way of building. Here is old Philadelphia, it's still there today. Boston picks it up, builds Beacon Hill, the Back Bay, the South End, here's Beacon Hill, um, a great neighborhood in the Dutch tradition, in the London tradition, the North Atlantic tradition. New York, if New York didn't have skyscrapers, People would think of New York as one of the great row house cities in the world. Up until about 1850, it had nothing but row houses, and it still has thousands of them, some of them the best in the, in the country. Uh, many of them built in brownstone, which New York has, and New Yorkers call them brownstones. Um, and here is Baltimore in 1850. Looking south from Mount Vernon Place, Baltimore is a brand new city in 1850. It's still being built, and it is a city of row houses laid out in neat rows and squares with great classical monuments. So the North Atlantic building world has come together by 1850, and you can go from Amsterdam to Baltimore, and the houses look about the same. There's one way of building, um, and it all makes sense. Uh, and row houses have snob value in the first half of the 19th century. If you want to know whether your place is a real city and not just a town or a village, you ask, do we have row houses? If you have row houses, you're a city. Row houses are the skyscrapers of the early 19th century. They show that you have arrived. Well, it all looks pretty easy. History is hardly ever easy. I don't need to tell a historical society this. By the time Mount Vernon Place was getting built, the North Atlantic cities had invented the Industrial Revolution. In the long run, the Industrial Revolution was a good thing. It made us all rich and we lived longer and good thing. Uh, in the short run, however, it made our cities uninhabitable messes. Here is a perfectly typical view of a coal burning city in the Industrial Revolution. And London looked like that, Amsterdam looked like that, Baltimore looked like that, Philadelphia looked like that. A quarter of all the people who died in Victorian England died of respiratory diseases. Not to mention the fact 
that these cities grew from being tiny to being enormous before people invented reservoirs and water systems, sewage systems or sewage treatment plants, and people were dying of typhoid fever. And in the city of Manchester in England, there were only two gallons of water per person per day for decade after decade. Think about that. Um, so the first great challenge that the North Atlantic cities faced was the Industrial Revolution. They let a genie out of the bottle and they had to figure out how to control that genie. They did. Uh, they did by first and foremost, by getting serious about scientific discoveries and the application of science to practical life. Every one of the North Atlantic cities created some great scientific institution. Uh, here is our candidate, Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Hospital, where more than anywhere on earth, science was put to the practical use of saving lives and making people more comfortable. Um, so the advance of science, which the word scientist does not appear until about 1850. And you don't until 1850 get organized bodies for scientific research, but then you do. And it helps to tame the genie that the industrial revolution lets out of the bottle. To make life more pleasant in these crowded smoky cities, the North Atlantic cities invent the public park. Cities before then did not have public parks. If they were lucky enough to have kings, the kings might say, you can walk on my lawn every now and then. But the idea that a city government would have a public park for all the people, this was brand new. The first public park didn't happen until 1840 in Liverpool in England. But by 1860, everybody had them. Druid Hill Park in Baltimore is 1860. Central Park in New York is 1857. Uh, the, the, the first great public parks are a response to the squalor of the Industrial Revolution, making it better. Perhaps the most significant thing was the invention of public transportation. And public transportation was invented in the row house cities. It was invented in the same year in Manchester in England and in New York City, New York, 1832. Why is this important? These cities were growing enormously. New York went from 60,000 people to 4 million people in 100 years. And people had to get to work, people had to get around. A horse drawn streetcar like this can go twice as fast as you can walk. And so it allowed cities to get bigger. And the North Atlantic cities used mass transit to make it possible for people to continue to live in houses as they were used to. The French cities and the German cities were much slower to use mass transit. And as a result, they got more and more crowded and more and more and more crowded. So that today, Paris is four times more crowded than London or Baltimore. And London and Baltimore are about equally crowded. Mass transit, the greatest invention of the North Atlantic cities, I think. By the middle of the 19th century, a lot of people are making money. And there is the mass production of good housing. Here is middle-class housing mass produced in London in 1840, 1841. Here is middle-class housing mass produced in Baltimore in 1847, 1852. Uh, the house of H.L. Mencken is in this view. Middle-class people are beginning to get the kind of good architecture that only rich people had before. Uh, and they're getting it in large quantity by about 1850. By 1900, even working class people are getting good housing. And this I think is the first time I know of in human history that working class people get good houses. These are good working class houses, six room houses in London from about 1900. These are good six room houses in Patterson Park in Baltimore from about 1900. Um, these are the, and working class people are living much better in our cities in 1900 than working class people in Germany or France or God knows Russia where they have a big revolution. So by, the, by about 1900, the people of the North Atlantic cities think that they have solved all their problems and everything's going to be just ducky from then on. 
The 20th century, of course, had some rude surprises for them. World War I was a pretty rude surprise. And if that wasn't rude enough for you, there was always World War II. So the easy optimism of 1900 uh, took, took a beating in the first half of the 20th century. And then after World War II, in America particularly, our cities get challenged by something that is not the work of a foreign enemy, by something that we all want ourselves, by the private car, the 57 Chevrolet, sweet, smooth, and sassy. And all of a sudden it becomes possible for just about everybody to get out of the city altogether. After all, you can't park, park all these sweet, smooth, and sassy Chevys on city streets. There aren't enough parking spaces. You need a landscape like this. And here is post-war America. This is Levittown outside New York. Small identical houses, lots of parked cars and room to park them. And as people who can afford cars move out of cities, people who can't afford cars move into cities. A lot of them are members of racial and colonial groups that have been discriminated against for a long time and continue to be discriminated against. And in the 1960s, you get urban riots uh, that are known as race riots, usually black people burning their own neighborhoods. Many of us remember this from Baltimore. It's not just Baltimore. This picture is London. The same thing was happening in London and in the British cities and in the Dutch cities where they had people from the old Dutch colonies uh, in South America and particularly Indonesia. So, and then the final double whammy, having the industrial revolution was hard, but then losing industry altogether was also, also hard. And the North Atlantic cities, which became the first industrial cities, became the first post-industrial cities. This happens in the 1970s and 80s. It throws hundreds of thousands of people out of work. Suddenly the skills of millions of people are useless on the job market. And our cities begin to fall into decay. Here's a picture of old houses in Baltimore in 1974, abandoned. Um, Baltimore still has abandoned houses. But Baltimore is certainly not the only city to have ab abandoned buildings. And in the mid 1970s, when all of the North Atlantic cities hit bottom, Baltimore was perfectly typical. Here's Baltimore in the mid 1970s. Here's Philadelphia. And here's the worst of them, the South Bronx in New York. Uh, you think of New York as the richest city in the world. You think of New York as the city of the, that is the center of the world business and financial system. In 1975, New York came one day away from bankruptcy. It had finally lost too many of its middle class people. It had lost too many of its tax paying people to the suburbs. It could no longer afford to run itself. It borrowed money for a while, but after a while, the lenders wouldn't lend anymore. The mayor of New York said, we're going to go bankrupt. He appealed to the president of the United States, Gerald Ford, who was a nice guy and said, we're your greatest city, help us out. And here's how the New York Daily News reported Ford's response. Ford city dropped dead. The president of the United States in 1975, who was a nice guy, thought that the United States could get along without New York City. And in fact, if you read the urban writings of the mid 1970s, most intelligent people thought that cities were obsolete. They thought that cities would fall apart. They didn't think that there would be any more cities, no more London, no more New York, no more Baltimore. They'd all go away and everybody would drive everywhere and do business by phone. And that is what the biggest urban thinkers thought in 1975. Well, somehow that didn't happen. Here's Baltimore Harbor a couple of years ago. Baltimore Harbor has about four times more stuff on it than it did in 1975. And all of the North Atlantic cities have come back much more strongly than anybody expected. And they've done it by doing something that nobody was even thinking seriously about in 1975. They've done it by 
making themselves into nice places to live, places that people enjoy. A city in the Industrial Revolution, you just went there because it's where the work was. But today, here is a square in London, and people are just enjoying to be there. And here is a sidewalk in Baltimore, and people are just enjoying to be there. And they like being in public and they're renting apartments and they're buying houses. And the historic architecture of our cities has become a major draw. I can remember, you can probably remember when Americans didn't like old buildings. You can probably remember when it was sort of lonely to have an interest in history. Uh, and you know, people just thought that old buildings and row houses were, you like row houses? Oh God, yuck. Um, well, no more. Here are old row houses in Washington. I can remember when these houses were tumbled down and some of them were vacant. No more. Uh, they are now great assets. Uh, but not old historic buildings only. This is about the weirdest looking apartment house I've ever seen. And it's two blocks away from the great 17th century canals of Amsterdam. Luckily, you can't see it from the 17th century canals of Amsterdam. Uh, but it's there. There's more than one way that people want to live, and the successful cities are accommodating the various different ways that people want to live. Finally, our downtowns, you know, the American downtown is a big American invention. They have, people thought that they were going to shut down and go away and no more skyscrapers. In fact, they're bigger and stronger and brighter than they've ever been. This is Philadelphia. But they're not just office buildings anymore. If you look at these Philadelphia buildings, here they are again as seen from the street. And in Philadelphia, you can work in one of those tall towers and live in an old North Atlantic row house two blocks walk from work. The successful cities are all doing this. Their centers are becoming places where people work but also where people live and where people sit in parks and sit at cafes in Philadelphia, in Federal Hill, in Baltimore, and throughout the North Atlantic world. And as for these beat up, broken down houses of 1974 in the center of Baltimore, here's what the backs of them look, looked like in 1974. I wish I'd taken a picture of the fronts of them in 1974. Here are the fronts today. Um, as Baltimore has tens of thousands of people who could afford to live in Harford County, but are choosing to live in row houses in Baltimore City. That was not the case in 1975. It is the case today. Baltimore is a lot healthier than, than the TV stations make it out to be. And in fact, all of the North Atlantic cities are going through one of their good patches. So here's an introduction to the North Atlantic cities, the cities that have row houses. You in Harford County have Baltimore to the south, Philadelphia to the north, Lancaster, York, Harrisburg out there somewhere, and people are building row houses in your midst every day. So uh, here is our world. I've had a ball of a time discovering it, and uh, I hope it's of interest to you. Jackie, thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, we don't have time for a lot of questions, but we do have um, a couple that have come in. Um, the first question that I saw <clears throat> is, were there row houses? Were there any row houses in Paris before the renovation of the city in the 1800s, or did it always have apartment blocks? It had the, it had the kind of tall shacks that London had, except that even then, they were multifamily housing. Parisians never had single family housing. Um, one of the questions that we had that came from a mutual friend, uh, Bob Lynch, talked yeah. about specifically about Patterson Park. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you answered earlier part of his question, which was, the sec was this section of Baltimore ever considered highly desirable for housing? And you said it was primarily um, housing for the working class. What do you, lessons do you think we can learn from the renovation of um, and the re revitalization of the Patterson Park area that might be applicable in other communities 
Well, there's a, there's a question I spend a lifetime answering, but uh, the neighborhoods of Patterson Park were the great center of good housing for stable working class people in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and how good were the houses? They were so good that upper middle class people are delighted to live in them today. Uh, the neighborhoods of Patterson Park got beat over the head in the decades after World War II. In part, stable working class people made more money and bought cars and moved to places like Harford County. Um, and in part, um, you know, they did the, the architecture just went out of style. Living in row houses went out of style. People didn't want to do it. Slum landlords began to buy things. Things went from bad to worse. Um, I was part of a, I was the chairman of an effort called the Patterson Park Community Development Corporation um, that set out to prevent the decline of the neighborhoods around Patterson Park. And in a period of 10 years, we bought and restored about 400 houses and stabilized the neighborhoods north of the park and the good neighborhoods around the park are growing now. I would say it has, it, it, it takes a small number of things. First of all, you have to make people like the architecture that you have. Second, you have to make people like each other. We, are, we didn't have a marketing budget. We couldn't have TV commercials or anything. So what we had to do was to think of things that would get neighbors doing things together so that neighbors realized how much they liked each other and liked living together and would then talk it up so that you know, if I had just moved to Baltimore and I was trying to figure out where I wanted to live and I was standing around the water cooler at work and somebody was telling me I live in Patterson Park and it's just great, well, then maybe I'd look for a house in Patterson Park. And that stuff worked. And then the park itself, a bunch of wonderful people organized a parks conservancy that slowly but surely, uh, with a combination of private and public money, made the park a good, useful place, organized sports leagues. There are now sports leagues in Patterson Park with, I think, 4,000 members, all organized. The, the, the nighttime ones are organized by bars, and the daytime ones are, I think they're organized by bars too. But um, so a lot of bars around Patterson Park, um, but a, a lot of things, and uh, a combination of architecture and people. Okay. Um when we have one more question, um, I think we have time for this. You mentioned Druid Hill Park. You mentioned Druid Hill Park. Can mm -hmm. you comment on Clifton Park and the Hopkins Mass Mansion in that park? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, every city neighborhood was once a suburb, and uh, Clifton was originally a country house. You know, they were built in I think eighteen three or something like that. Uh, and it's named after a beautiful suburb of Bristol in England. So it was a, you know, an hour's walk outside of Baltimore when it was new. Then in 1851, Johns Hopkins bought it and made it vastly bigger than it, than it is. Uh, and it's a fascinating place. Originally, the trustees of Johns Hopkins University thought that the university would move out to Clifton. But they decided not to do that. And they did a land swap with the city where the city gave them some of one park and the university gave Clifton to the city to create Clifton Park. Um, as far as I can tell, it's a strong asset, but the neighborhoods to the south of it are in trouble. The neighborhoods along the Bel Air Road are in trouble. The neighborhoods along the Harford Road to the north of it have, have been in trouble for a long time and are actually starting to get better. And the neighborhoods to the northeast of it are pretty strong. So, um, a lot to be said about it. I would go there frequently if I played golf. It has a golf course, but I don't play golf. Um, the row houses or terrace houses that line the streets in the major cities we talk about, you've talked about establish an architectural edge and a street view. Mm -hmm. Harford County is primarily rural and suburban in character. Mm -hmm. What lessons from the North American cities could be applied to Harford County's future development? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the key one. Um, the people who are best at, at what you're talking about are the Dutch. And the Dutch are building brand new suburbs now uh, of 
row houses that actually work and are connected to each other and to cities by good public transport. Um, all the successful urban areas that I know nowadays have good public transport. Um, and if you, you know, if, if, if you look at the change that has happened to Washington in my lifetime, largely I think because Washington built a good subway system. Um, Baltimore, Philadelphia, uh, the British cities of Birmingham and Manchester and Liverpool are lagging behind and you can see it. Um, that the, the, the successful cities now are all cities that have invested in good public transport. How would that work in Hartford County? Um, the Southern part of the county is on Amtrak and you've just got the most splendid setup you could imagine. Um, there are stops at, at Haverty, could be one at Haverty Grass, I don't think there is. There's certainly one today on, for Amtrak at Aberdeen and there's one for Mark at Edgewood uh, and these should be major assets for Harford County. Um, it would be nice if it were easier to get to those stations by public transport. If you could take a quick bus from Falston or, or Bel Air down to a train station and then you could actually, and it would be nice if the trains ran faster. A marked train from Edgewood takes an hour and 20 minutes to get to Washington and that's a long time. Um, if I were running the Baltimore region, um, I would build a subway line from Baltimore Penn Station to downtown Baltimore. And then Harford County would be a very short hop away from a large job base and you wouldn't have to drive and you wouldn't have to park. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be done there, but um, it's, it's hard. Harford County is so automotive. The, 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 the densities are in most places Houston densities, and it would be very difficult to retrofit Harford County so that people don't have to drive so much. Uh, I'd be glad to give it a try, but it would be very hard. Okay, well, thank you so much. This has just been fascinating, and I could go on for a long time, but as you know, our time today is limited. Um, if you who are listening and watching have enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation or becoming a member of the Historical Society of Harford County. You can visit our website at www.harfordhistory.org where you can purchase Charlie's book through the bookstore. Um, Charlie, if you haven't already done so, if you'll switch it back over, we'll put up a slide. Uh, uh, share. Uh, later this month, we will invite you to join an international viewing audience of the short-term Strike for Freedom, Frederick Douglass in Scotland. That's on March the 19th at 1230, with a second viewing at 6.30 p.m. on the same day. The film is followed by a discussion with the film's director and producer, Parisia Urquhart, and Morgan University professor, David Terry. The Historical Society is very pleased to co-sponsor this virtual event that's presented by the Harford Community College. Our next virtual brown bag lunch is on Tuesday, April the 13th at 1230 p.m. Retired Harford County Judge William Carr will regale us with stories of wicked women, eccentric women, and other tales. This is a free event. You can reserve your ticket today on the Historical Society's website. And on April 14th, we will have a program entitled uh, Brick Walls, Finding When You Find Brick Walls and Researching Your Family's History Through Our Genealogy Committee. That will be in the evening. Again, information on all of our events is available at www.harfordhistory.org. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Charlie, for joining us. You are, as always, a fascinating speaker. Um, and everybody, have a good day. Thanks so much.